the table. <laughs> What's that saying? To a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? To a, uh, someone with a butt, everything looks like a chair. <laughs> um, cool. Um, all right, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started by welcome everybody back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And this is going to be uh, part two of our study of the Sri Mala Devi Simhanada Sutra, otherwise known as the Lion's Roar of Queen Sri Mala. Um, as I mentioned, this is going to be part two. Part one, which happened last week, was kind of a detailed overview of the sources. I chose to take advantage of this sutra, the fact that there's a bunch of different English translations, there's several Chinese translations, there's a Tibetan translation. And so last week I decided to spend a little time going over the sources, when the sources date from, um, and just sort of really literally contextualizing this sutra. Um, and I, although I did start to read it last time, I didn't really get very far. And it was one of those situations where I just sort of read it and started answering some questions. And so I've spent the week, the past week, really going over this first chapter, doing a very close reading of the, the different translations, the two different Chinese translations I talked about last time, uh, comparing it, uh, of course, with all the English translations. And so tonight, I'm going to start from the beginning of the sutra, really quickly kind of bring us up to speed on the characters. And then we're going to do a very kind of close uh, reading, a close look at the what is really the heart of the, the, the sutra, um, which is this poem. It's called a gatha, uh, a poem uh, that this Queen Srimala recites. Um, and so, um, as I mentioned, there's two Chinese translations, one from the 400s and one from the 700s. We're reading, or I, I should say, I am uh, reading primarily the earlier translation of this by Gunabhadra, a Buddhist monk from India named Gunabhadra, who translated this sutra from Sanskrit into Chinese in the 400s. Um, so we're reading from uh, that. And there is an English translation of that by Diana Paul. And that's in this book, the BDK, the BDK version. This is Diana Paul's translation of the Srimala, uh, along with a copy of the Vimalakirti Sutra, but we're not doing Vimalakirti, we're doing Srimala. Uh, so you should know that Diana Paul's translation in here is of the earlier Chinese Gunabhadra version. Um, I myself uh, this week spent a lot of time going back and forth between the earlier Gunabhadra from the fifth century, 400s. I've been contrasting that with the later version of Bodhiruchi from the 700s. And it's, it's been really interesting. And I want to share some of those insights with you and kind of a little bit of the translation process. But my main purpose tonight is to really kind of dig into the, the ideas of this poem, and in particular, kind of the ideas of this sutra. This is a, this is a Mahayana sutra through and through. This is truly a Mahayana sutra. And so it has a lot of care, qualities to it in that way that I want to highlight. Um, and like all good Mahayana sutras, we have a story. And so I want to quickly just go over the beginning of this. Um, I, by the way, too, if you're reading from Diana Paul's uh, translation, 
or if you're back in our good old heap of jewels in the Ratnakuta and you're reading this version, this is a translation of the, the later version of Bodoruchi from the 700s. It's a little different. So if you're reading any of those, you're going to notice differences because I'm actually reading from a translation I'm working on. Because as usual, I'm not satisfied with any of the translations out here. Um, they're not using all the words I like to use for translations and things like that. And so I'm going to go through this with you, how this kind of, uh, how it sounds so far. Not much has really changed. I have to say it's a pretty straightforward sutra as far as the kind of the specific words, but um, well, let's dive in. So this is a, this is how it starts. Like all sutras, thus have I heard. Once the Buddha was in Shravasti, in the Jetavanda, Anatha Pindika's park. Period. <laughs> That's the setting, the ones have, thus have I heard. And now we are introduced to the kind of the plot of this. And this is where it says, at that time, King Prasanajit and Queen Malika of Shravasti, right, of this place where the Buddha is, they are the king and queen of that place. Well, they, it says, they had just come to have faith in the Dharma, and they said to each other, our daughter, Queen Srimala, is wise and with good faculties or mental acuteness. She's sharp and clever, it says. If she had a chance to see the Buddha, she would certainly understand the Dharma, her mind being without doubt. At a suitable time, we should send word to generate her thoughts to the way, to the Tao, to enlightenment. The queen said, now's the right time. <laughs> And so the king and the queen then wrote Sri Mala a letter praising the immeasurable merits of the Tathagata, of the thus come one. Then they sent a messenger named Chandira with the letter to the land of Ayodhya. Entering the palace, the messenger respectfully offered the letter to Sri Mala. Srimala received the letter joyfully, raising it to her head. She read and recited the letter, receiving and retaining it, remembering it, memorizing it maybe, thus giving rise to a most rare mind. She then said to the messenger Chandida in verse, and that brings us to the poem. <laughs> so that's the introduction. Um, by the way, I also mentioned last week that I'm also um, using or relying upon or uh, um, uh, referring to a very famous commentary on this sutra by, the, by a prince, a Japanese prince named Shotoku. Um, so Shotoku is a very famous uh, Japanese prince, patron of Buddhism from, I believe, the 700s. I think he was from the mid six or the 7th century, late 600s, I think. Don't quote me on that, though. But from around that time period. And Shotoku wrote these famous commentaries on a few different sutras, this being one of them. And it's been, it's fascinating reading these old commentaries because they go into such detail about like almost every word. In some cases, they, they even go into great lengths on each word. And I'm not going to go into too much about what Shotoku says about the introduction to this. Um, he kind of fills in some interesting backstories about King, King Prasanajit, Queen Malika, and things like that. Um, a lot of stuff I mentioned last week, so I'm not going to go into that. But, you know, the basic idea is, is that this is a story about the king and the queen, Prasanajit and Malika, who they've just come to have faith in the Dharma. 
And they think, you know, our daughter, she's very sharp. She's very smart, very wise. And then it says this thing that if she were to have a chance to see the Buddha, she would understand the Dharma, right? And develop great faith and not have doubt. So they decide to send her a letter. I've drawn the letter up here. She gets the letter. She reads, memorizes the letter, develops this rare mind, it says, from reading the letter, and then turns to Chandira, the messenger, and says this poem. And last week, I just read the poem. I read Diana Paul's translation. I might have changed a few words, as I usually do. Um, but for the most part, I just read the whole poem last time. And there were a few questions, rightfully so. It's a deep poem. And so I want to go through this sort of stanza by stanza. I might read from the other translations to give you a feel for the, the variety of ways these ideas could be interpreted. But my main goal is to really give this poem its, its due credit. And it's like, I want, I would really like for, for all of us to really feel this, this poem. It's so interesting. Um, in particular, it's really, really beautiful in Chinese. And I wanna try to share with you a little bit of the nuances that are going on with the language here. Um, yeah, and th this is a really great format, this sort of um, audiovisual format in that way, because it would be really difficult to write a lot of this out. Um, but let's go. Um, so this is her poem, and I'm just gonna read the first stanza and then kind of break it down. Right away, it's, it's, it's tricky, and I mentioned this last time. Diana Paul has the opener a, a, as this, and I'll just start with hers as like the baseline. So the opening stanza says, I hear the name Buddha, Buddha, the one who is rarely in the world. If my words are true, that the Buddha is now in the world, then I will honor him. Okay, that's, that's pretty much what it says. The tricky part about this is, is that, so these poems, and let me see if I could, uh, this is going to be a bit of a mess here, but if you can see in the Chinese, this is the body of the introduction that I read about queen, about the king and the queen saying, hey, we should send Sri Mala a letter. And then this is the poem. There's another stanza on the other page, but this is the bulk of it. And as you might be able to see, sorry to get so close to the microphone, it's in these five character groupings. It's five characters, five characters, five characters, five characters. And that's a stanza. So this idea of, I hear the name of the Buddha, the one rarely in the world. If these words are true, uh, then I will honor him. So those are the, the 5, 10, 15, 20 characters there. But let me just kind of share with you, the, and I'm not going to do this, by the way, for every stanza, but I, this opener is, it gives you a, uh, it, it'll just give you a little taste for, for how this reads. So I've written the, actually the opening line here from the Gunabhadra translation here, where she says, um, my Chinese pronunciation isn't great, so I'm not going to really get into that. Um, but the verbatim character by character of that first line is, I hear the sound Buddha, Buddha. And it's, I said this last week, it's not really clear what exactly that means. Diana Paul has translated as, I hear the name Buddha, but the word name is nowhere in here. It's really literally just, I hear Buddha sound. Now, classical Chinese, this is written in classical Chinese. Classical Chinese is notoriously broad and very open in that way. And so what I mean to say is, is that this opener isn't really clear what exactly she Queen Srimala is hearing. So, but then it gets even more complicated in that there's like this kind of beautiful thing that happens. So I hear the sound Buddha. 
And then the second part of that is um, like the one, like it's not even the one, it's about so rare that the, the it, 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 yeah, it's so already very difficult, but it's about rarely being in the world, rarely being in the world. And you could read that as the one who is rarely in the world, but you could also kind of, it is a line, it is a single sentence. And so what's beautiful about it is, is if you pause at the first part of it, she's saying, I hear the sound of the Buddha. And that sound is rarely in the world. Or it's this kind of thing of like, I hear, I hear, and this is where it gets tricky because in Chinese, it's actually a lot like English. You know how in English we have this, um, I guess you would just call it a saying or a euphemism where you would say like, um, oh, I, he I hear that's a good movie. I, I hear it's a good movie. Now, are you saying you literally like heard somebody? Kind of. But in English, when we say, I hear, I hear it's a good movie, it's sort of like the word, word on the street is. <laughs> And it, that's another saying in English. When we say word on the street, we don't literally mean words on the street. It's a, it's a saying. Similarly, in Chinese, when you say wo wen, when you say these two words, I hear, it can mean like it has been said. It has been said that the sound butta is rarely in the world. And that's actually kind of the, the reading that I, I kind of, want to go with is this I but it, it, I, again it's so beautiful in Chinese because you can have both you can have it be this thing where she's saying I hear I hear the sound Buddha so rarely in the world or she could be saying I hear that the sound Buddha is rarely in the world <laughs> then the second line is this one about if these words are true it's another one that could be read a few different ways. However, when we go and we read Bodhiruchis, so we refer to the later 700s version of this, we realize, ah, okay, he has an imperative particle. The imperative particle is this idea of if, if these words are true. So that allows us to go back and reread Gunabhadras and it says, okay, yeah, so she's saying, like, if this is true, that the sound Buddha is rarely in the world, then I should make offerings or I should honor, I should praise this, it, praise the Buddha, praise the sound, praise the name, all of it's very kind of vague in that way. And it's also sort of, I guess it's, it's assumed that when she says, I hear the sound Buddha, Either way, either way, it would seem like she's referring to the letter that she got from her parents, that, that she read it and then got this message about the Buddha and now is saying to Chandira, the messenger, I hear the sound of the Buddha, the one rarely in the world. If this is true, I should make offerings. Yeah. Okay, that's the first line. And then she says, oh, sorry, let me check. That's okay. So that's a great question. So there's a great question in the chat of, about did the king and the queen want their daughter to see the Buddha in person? I, and I'm glad somebody asked that. Thank you, Allison. But this poem and this sutra is very much about the idea of seeing the Buddha <laughs> and what that means. In fact, get ready because Srimala is about to have a vision and see the Buddha. The one thing that I can say right now, just to plant a nice, like a nice seed for the rest of tonight and, and even further, we have a, a saying in English. You know, in English, when you, you finally get something and you, you say, oh, I see. 
do you see with your eyes when you say that? When you say, oh, I see. No, in English, when we use that expression and we say, oh, I see, oh, I get it. Do you literally get something? Do you literally see something? No, these are expressions in English to describe knowledge, understanding. Oh, I see. I would suggest it's that kind of seeing that's being spoken about in this sutra. So that when the king and the queen say that if, if Srimala had a chance to, to see, if she had a chance to get it, she'd get it in that way. So um, this is so a great question, Allison. And this is really about seeing the Buddha. And I'll have, again, it's going to get interesting here in moments, in moments. And so we'll, we're, we're going to see if we can see. <laughs> so the next stanza is this, um, and this is one too, where I feel like, I feel like there's an emotion to this poem that isn't really captured in any of the English translations that, that I have available here. And the, there's an emotion here of, I mean, I would describe it as elation, that Srimala is elated. She's ecstatic. She's really kind of elated in that sense. And so she says this opening line about hearing the sound Buddha. And then she says, respectfully, Buddha, world honored one. Since you have come into the world for all, then have pity on me or bestow pity on me and cause me to see is, is literally what it, what it kind of says. So the first part of that is, is this really, again, this um, uh, adoring, adorational uh, two characters for respect, respectfully, Buddha. Uh, Shurzun, world honored one, Bhagavan, as it's called in Sanskrit. These are titles or, uh, I guess, epithets for the Buddha, right? So, oh, respectfully, Buddha, world honored one. And then it says, the second part of that is this idea, she's kind of saying this thing that basically you, you came into the world to save everybody. What, that would include me, right? I'm, I'm in the world. And so if or having come into the world for all, for everyone, then have pity. This word's tricky because it, the English word pity is a loaded term, but it is this idea of like, be kind to me, show me kindness. And then the last part of this, which also pertains to our wonderful question that was asked, the five characters are like you 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 have to you must you you must cause like cause me to have a look <laughs> cause me to see it's actually about um yeah in fact the way that the verb for this is it it's very much like i was just saying with this idea of oh i see like so she's like cause me to see cause me to see. Then, so those are the first two lines or first two stanzas, I should say. And then this is where I'm, I'm playing with something. I want to tell you this. So if I were to go back to Diana Paul's translation really quick, she translates this very narratively where she says, at that very moment of reflection, the Buddha appeared in heaven, radiating pure light in all directions and revealing his incomparable body. That's Diana Paul's translation. So the, the first thing that I'm trying to play with here is, you'll notice, or you may have noticed, and I'm already starting to do the thing where I throw the papers everywhere. But you may have already noticed that this is all the poem. This is all her poem. 
And I actually think that the Chinese allows for this to, to remain in the voice of Srimala. In other words, so not a, an omniscient narrative, narrator, so not a narrative break, but you could actually read this as, so rather than Diana Paul's where it's narrative, and then in that very moment, this thing happened, you could read it as when I, when I generate or when I produce or generate this mindfulness or when I generate this mind, the Buddha appears out of nowhere or the Buddha appears out of space. I want to talk about that line, um, but we can just sort of finish the stanza and then break it all down. So when I give rise to this mind, the Buddha appears out of space. The Buddha appears out of nowhere, giving off pure light, radiating pure light everywhere, revealing an incomparable body. So that's my kind of rough translation right now where I'm trying to kind of keep this in a very beautiful like middle zone of grammar where it, it could be read narratively, but it could also be read out of the, uh, as the voice of Srimala. I made a really big deal last time about the first part of this, where it says that out of or generated from this nian, the Chinese character is nian, and nian, I mean, it means thought, but it's also the character for sati, shmurti, for mindfulness. It's a very important Buddhist word. So it's, even though it means thought, it's a particular type of thought that corresponds to, again, in San, or Pali, sati, Sanskrit, shmurti, this idea of recollection or recall. But it's a very kind of established practice within Mahayana Buddhism to do mindfulness, to do sati on the, an image of the Buddha or on a visualization of the Buddha. So this is called nianfo, and that means mindfulness of the Buddha. And again, it's a practice. It's a well-established Mahayana type of meditation where you're doing sati, you're doing focused attention attention, but not on, say, the breath or the body or sensations or chitta, mind states, or even dharmas, the fourth foundation of mindfulness. So not necessarily on any of those, but you're actually doing a concentration exercise, again, using an image of the Buddha or an, uh, the idea of Buddha, like a kind of a, a mental visualization it would seem like that's what Srimala is doing here. And so I think that, that that line shouldn't be glossed over as, and in that, at that moment, it, it's like, it's a very specific moment. It's a moment when she has kind of generated, and, and by the way, it said, she read the letter and generated a most rare mind. She, yo, shin, that it says, and that's a very, important Buddhist expression, most rare, shi yo, shin, so out of, in this state of mindfulness, it says, and then this is the other part, the Buddha, oh, and I think I wrote it here, uh, yeah, right here, so this is the line that I'm about to work on or kind of talk about, and it basically says the Buddha, at the Buddha, out of the middle, of nothing manifested is <laughs> literally what those five characters kind of break down and mean. Um, by the way, uh, that's where we're going, Allison. That is where we're about to break down is, is what does this mean? So I was very stoked, super stoked actually, that I hadn't received, I had ordered my copy of the Prince Shotoku commentary I'd ordered it a while ago. It hadn't come yet. And so I did the thing I always do, which is download and print books I've already ordered so that I eventually have books and printouts of them. And all my notes are here. 
it's wonderful to have two copies and you never know where you put those notes. But anyway, so I printed, I printed out the Shotoku trans, uh, commentary and I read his commentary on this line and I was very, very excited to see that, well, first of all, I gotta tell you that our friend Boderucci, so the later translator, he clarifies, he clarifies this character. It's the middle character in this that is pronounced uh, kong, which is emptiness. That, that is the Chinese character for shunyata, shunya, or shunyata, emptiness. And if you were reading just the Gunabhadra, just this earlier translation, you might think, whoa, did the, he, is she saying the Buddha appeared out of shunyata, out of emptiness? And while that might be, you know, dharmically consistent or something to that effect, what's nice is when you read the Boderuchi, he adds a character, shu, and makes it shu kung. And when you do that, what you're saying is, no, 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 not emptiness, space. And space is this word akasha. Akasha is the Sanskrit word for space. Now, even Prince Shotoku, he sort of references, he says something about how the Buddha appeared in space because he couldn't fit in the palace. <laughs> and it's, so it's a very funny line. So he has two, two um, interpretations. One, he says, oh yeah, he, the Buddha appeared in space because he couldn't fit in the building. But then he follows it up by saying, but you, it also can be read that the Buddha appeared out of space. And that's my interpretation. And that's Allison's question is, what does that mean to appear out of space? And I'm, we're, gonna about, we're about to get into that. Now, once this happens and the Buddha radiates light everywhere, and reveals this incomparable body. This is really like the, the heart of the poem. This is like, whoa, this is it. And so again, I'm a little, um, you know, these, these translations, they just sort of gloss this as like events happening after events happening. And I really feel like this is an important moment. So that being the case, yeah, because it's just going to get more complicated if I don't do it now. And so I'm going to take the next little while, little bit, to describe what I think is a good dharmic way of understanding what they're talking about here. So yes, you know, I have even, upayically, in my drawing here, <laughs> I've drawn the Buddha on a little cloud, right? I, do I think the Buddha appeared before Sri Mala on a little cloud floating in heaven? No. I don't, but it's difficult to draw what I'm about to describe. And so for expediency's sake, I put the Buddha on a little cloud. And I think that for expediency's sake, Diana Paul says the Buddha appeared in heaven. I, I think it's a little misleading, the idea to say that the Buddha appeared in heaven, because that makes this sound a certain way that I don't really think is implied. Based upon the whole sutra, like where this is going, and you know, trust, trust that I know where this is going, right? The, the, the ideas that are about to be laid out in the sutra, I've read them, I know where this is going. And so this is not about the Buddha appearing in heaven. This is about the subtle, incomparable, as it says, the incomparable, incomparable body of the Buddha revealing itself out of space. And what does that mean? Well, I'm going to walk us through, and a lot of you have heard this a lot, and you're gonna hear it again. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna do a little quick talk about space, this idea of Akasha and try to tie this into how it could, what would, what would it really mean to actually see 
the Buddha emerge, or actually the word is manifest out of space. So space, Akasha, is this very important part of Buddhist philosophy, you call it. It's a big part of Indian, Indian philosophy in general. Buddhism, in a way being a type of Indian philosophy, continues with this idea of space. And so the idea here of space is that, well, I'm gonna use my example, the classic example to talk about space. This is just to put our, our minds in the right frame. But the idea here is, is that when we talk about space in Buddhism, we are really kind of pointing at or talking about formlessness, right? And if you're familiar with what would be called the Arupadhatu, the formless realm, you might know that there's kind of varying levels or dimensions to formlessness. It's a very, very subtle thing, formlessness, that which has no shape form or discernibility. And so within the realm of formlessness, the kind of the premier example of formlessness is this idea of space. And so if you're not familiar with this kind of framework, I'm going to talk about an example. So here is an example of a, in a, you know, something sort of. And the idea here is, is that we kind of have a few options. And the way I usually would do this is, is a kind of a joke of, uh-oh, did you hear that? Somebody's at the door. Let's go see who it is. And when we look through the peephole, we see that. And the idea is, is we're trying to figure out what's on the other side of the door in that way. And for expediency sake, for the sake of this example, let's imagine that there's two people and one person looked through the door and saw two faces, saw two faces and steps back from the people and says, oh, there's people at the door. <laughs> oh, and this person has like social anxiety. So they're like a little, um, nervous that there's people at the door, right? But then there's this other person who is looking at this person, they're getting nervous and they're thinking, whoa, why are they so nervous? Let me go have a look. And they look through the peephole and they see a, a, a glass, like a, a champagne glass. And they get all excited because they love champagne. They love wine, they love champagne. So they're stoked. They're, they're like, the party has arrived. So this person is having a pleasant sensory experience, let's call it, a pleasant experience, and is excited about what they saw because they think there's champagne on the other side of the door. This person's a little nervous because it's people and, you know, all of that. So what we have here are actually a, a, a good example of what is called the tri datu, the three realms, the realm of desire, the kama datu, the realm of form, the rupa datu, and then that formless realm, the realm of, of no form, formlessness, which we're going to equate for now with the idea of space. So let's walk through that. The idea here, of course, is, is that these two people are having two different vinyana, two different conscious experiences. So one vinyana, one consciousness is seeing these two people and being nervous about those people, right? And that, that nervousness, that's what's called the realm of desire or kamadatu. And it's important to know or keep in mind that when we say realm of desire, it's not just about wanting things. Desire, or I should actually just say kama, K-A-M-M-A, -M -M -A, kama, 
it's not just about wantiness. And what I mean by that is, is that when this person sees the two people, sees the two faces and is like getting nervous, it's because they, what they want is for these people to go away. <laughs> That's what they want. That's their comma dot two. So what I mean to say is, is that comma, the desire, it could go either way, like wantiness or aversion in that sense. It's sort of about, it's more about the emotion involved because this other person who is seeing the glass of champagne, they're also in their realm of desire, in their comma dot two. Their Kamadatu is stoked, though. Their Kamadatu is excited and happy because they like champagne. So two different conscious experiences, having two different Vedana, sensory reactions, one pleasant, one not pleasant, all right? Now, the Kamadatu is about these reactions these emotions, these feelings, and not sensory feelings in that way, but emotional feelings, anxiety, stress, excitement. That's the kamadatu. What's important to recognize about the kamadatu, of course, is that this person's kamadatu, the person who's like getting excited and ready, that's their little universe that's based upon their consciousness that's based upon the way that they perceived a form, a shape. This person's kamadatu is all nervous from the way they perceived a form or a shape. And so again, the most important thing to for right now about the kamadatu is that the kamadatu is really deeply, uniquely our own because it's really our own reaction to our own sensations, to our own conditioning, creating our own consciousness in that way. So from a Buddhist point of view, and this all, everything I'm saying now, of course, stretches all the way back to the beginning of Buddhism, to the very beginning turning of the wheel in that sense. But the idea here is, is that here's, here's where the Dharma kicks in. When this person is like, what are you so excited about? And this person's like, why are you being so negative and down? And then they start to argue because they're having two different sensory reactions, but actually they're, they're perceiving two totally different things. And this person, whoa, and this person, <laughs> this person is again, like, why can't you... You don't see it the way I see it. And this person's saying the same thing. And so the, the tricky part about the kamadatu, about our realms of desire that we have kind of hang out in a lot, what, the tricky part about it is when we forget that it's our kamadatu, that, it, that everybody will have their own reactions to things. And it doesn't make their reactions invalid or anything like that, or mine more valid. It's, again, it's about the Bodhisattva, I would say, remembers, oh yeah, this is just my reaction to this. This is not a universal reaction. In fact, if we go a step deeper, remember I said that both people had a reaction to a shape. So the realm of desire is about, you know, to use some Freudian terms, it's like about projection, about psychological projection onto what the Buddhists would call the realm of form. The realm of form, the Rupa Datu, is the realm of shape, color, size, number is is this one or is it two is this void and this is solid or is this void and this is solid so the idea here is is that the realm of form 
is this very subtle realm of just, again, shape, light, and shadow. And if perceived correctly, the realm of form is very neutral in that sense. It, it's nothing to get worked up about because it's just some shapes, <laughs> sizes, and numbers in that way. If you're getting worked up in a way, then you're drifting into the Kamadatu and into realms of desire and the way things could be or should be or might be versus just observing the realm of form. But what's interesting about the example I'm laying out is that both of these people saw the same form, but they interpreted it, or I would say perceived, to use the Buddhist term, samnya, they perceived the realm of form differently. And because they received the realm of form differently, they generated two different forms, literally. This person, it was the shape. It looked like people's faces and it made me nervous, but it looked like people's faces. This person's like, no, no, no. Look, faces, what are you talking about, dude? It looked like a glass. It was in the shape of a glass. So the lesson here is, is that even the realm of form is a little tricky in that way. Now, the idea here again is, is that if we're getting all worked up and emotional about things, we're, that's the realm of desire. If we're just discerning shapes, color, size, and numbers, that's the realm of form. But again, even the realm of form is open to perceptive differences. In other words, it too is based upon conditioning. So a consciousness, a vinyana, a consciousness that is arising of a glass or two people, that's still going to be based on conditioning based upon perception, leading to different sensations, leading to different senses of form in that way. So the idea here is, is that there is also here, not just a realm of desire, if one has emotional feelings towards these things, not only is there the realm of form, but there is also the formless realm here, present. And so I used, I used this long introduction to present the, the formless realm. But where is this formless realm? Where is this realm of space? Well, it starts by noticing that if you are going to perceive two faces, that's going to require space. And what I mean by space is separation. <laughs> like that's space. Like this is the space between the two faces. In other words, you can think of this as the object. And then this is the, this is the nothing. This is the space between these. And let me just tell you this, if there wasn't in the space between these, they would collapse into maybe a single face, but they actually might collapse into indiscernibility. In other words, in order to discern anything, we need space. There needs to be like space around it kind of, for example, let's say that you discern this is the object, the glass, then this becomes space. And again, if this weren't space, then you know the glass would start to look different or something to that effect. So space is this weird dimension of reality. And it's a weird dimension that is sort of I mean, you can kind of think of it as the canvas of reality where the realm of form is sort of thrown onto, but that's not right 
entirely. Because space, Akasha, this space isn't anything. It allows for thinging. <laughs> it allows for thinging. So let me give you another example. How many? And the idea here is, is you might be sitting there going, well, it depends. It depends on whether you mean fingers or hands. Because if, it, if it's fingers, we would say five. But if it's hands, we would say one. And if we were to try to conceive of my fingers, you would have to allow for space between the palm of my hand and the finger. And what I'm getting at now is, is that space isn't, it's not really necessarily about this space, although this is absolutely necessary too, because if there weren't this space and this space, the fingers would collapse into one finger but there's space between them. But when I said that there's space too between the palm of my hand and the finger, is there space, but the space is up here. It's a conceptual space where you go like, oh, okay. Yeah, your, your finger, gotcha. And right there, as soon as you conceive of or discern my fingers, you do that via space. So I hope everybody's following me on this, that space is this interesting dimension in, that allows us to conceive of anything. There's a way in which you create space between me and this background. And it's what allows you to distinguish me from that. There's space. In other words, this space thing, it's like, again, everywhere and nowhere. And again, I'm gonna say this one more time because it's so important. The space that I'm talking about, it's not out here, it's in here. It's a dimension of consciousness in a sense or a dimension of discernment or discrimination. It's like the mind, Again, the mind needs space. Say, for you to understand two hands, there's all this space in between. Otherwise, again, they would collapse into a singularity in that sense. So if you're following me on this, which I hope you are, and we return to our original example, if we remember, oh, yeah. This person thought this was the space and so discriminated or discerned that there were two people. So this is the space. These are the objects. But then this person conceived of this as space and this is space and conceived of this as an object. So what you could actually do if you were really slick, you could actually kind of do what is called a type of samadhi practice where you, if you understand that this is space and this is space, you could actually kind of drift into what is called the realm of space where it's all just space in a way. And what I mean by that is, and many of you have heard me say this before, I, in thinking about Akasha, in thinking about space, I often, in thinking about it particularly as a dimension of consciousness and a dimension of discrimination, not as a, a dimension of physicality, like the physical world, but as a dimension of discernment, if you think of Akasha or space like, like that, I like to 
interpret, not translate, but interpret space as allowance. That space is this, this allowance. It's, it's a dimension that allows for kind of things to exist in a way. But remember, they exist in here just like the glass and the faces existed in the mind of each of these two individuals. So out of, and this is where we start to get back to our sutra, out of the realm of space, this person reached into the realm of space and pulled out two faces. This person reached into the realm of space and pulled out a glass. And when I say they reached into the realm of space and pulled these things out, of course, what I'm saying is, is that there's an, a realm of infinite space that the mind orders, order out of chaos, ex nihilo, out of nothingness, the mind orders space and discerns objects, fingers or hands, or just dude, one. one. So your mind, your, your mind can singularize me, can turn all of this into Michael, one thing. Or you can reach into the realm of space and start discerning fingers from hands, from arms, from and it goes on and on and on and on. It's, it's almost like there's an infinite pool of space out here that the mind can reach into and pull out whatever it would care to see in that way. I would suggest that it's that way of thinking that the sutra is talking about when it says, that in that state of mindfulness, the Buddha arose out of space. That would be my kind of dharmic interpretation of that. And again, this is, a, I'm, I'm, in, I'm interpreting it this way because of things that are to come where it's going to say these things explicitly. So it's not actually that much of a reach to interpret it that way. Questions, comments, answers, or ideas. <laughs> I, or everybody drifted off into the realm of infinite space and Michael, is in such a deep samadhi. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if uh, I may be misinterpreting Allison's question, but she uh, there's a second part to her about whether it, we're talking about the physical body or a body of knowledge. And I wonder if you could comment oh, on that. Excellent. Yeah, I didn't see that. And sorry, Alice, I don't look at the chat too much. So regarding the body of the Buddha, and indeed, this is about the body of the Buddha, re revealing an incomparable body. So I would sort of suggest that this is actually going, especially because, again, of where this sutra is going. It's not an easy question to answer what you ask. And what, why I say that is, is that because of what I said, there's such an intimate relationship between not knowledge and what would be considered a physical body. In, in other words, you might think of this as my physical body, but as I just described it, if you're doing that, that's a discernment that is happening out of a knowledge base that is arising out of space in that way, if that makes sense. And so, there, it, again, it's not as easy, it's not going to be as easy as physical body or body of knowledge. In fact, this is sort of riding a very thin line between the two and maybe even potentially trying to collapse them. 
no, they, it is trying to collapse them. Again, as I look forward in the sutra, it's very much where this is going is a, a very re understanding of our own physical bodies. Because again, let me actually, uh, Allison, because your question is so, so righteous, actually, you could also think of it this way. Remember everything I just said about being anxious or being excited, and that's the realm of desire, but then there's just the realm of form, but then there's the realm of space. In terms of one's own uh, understanding of their own body, understanding of themselves in that way, the three realms that I'm describing, the realm of desire, the realm of form, and the formless realm, they're, they're at play here in self-reflexive understanding, which is the kind of psychological stuff that we heap on ourselves, call it shame, call it guilt, call it this, call it that, but all of the emotional stuff and that's kind of a realm of desire. Again, the way things could be or should be or might be. And then you can kind of almost, and this is the, the practice in Buddhism, you can transcend that, uh, that baggage of psychology and just observe the body as form, just a shape, a size, not... Um, as I'm often saying, not tall, not short, not beautiful, not ugly, because those are actually all relative to other bodies, relative to other sizes, relative to other things. If you were to really just encounter your own body of form without the psychological dramas in that way, that would be a, a really radical different way of being embodied. There's even a deeper way place to go, though, which is when you kind of realize, oh, and I'm pulling this body out of a realm of infinite space. I'm discerning it in that way, cre creating my own body in that sense. That's a little heavy. That's kind of like the end of the sutra type stuff, but it was a good question. So, well, I, I just wanted to like, I just wanted to comment when you were talking or yeah, when we were talking about space, it, it was kind of hard for me to understand, but I, some parts I understood because there have definitely been moments where, um, or I think of space as like sight and touch. They're like meeting because well, sight is happening like I don't know, like on my hmm. eyeballs. <laughs> but then when I like reach out, I'm seeing like my hand, right? And then, but I'm also feeling it. So then that's hmm. how I'm like understanding space is like something I'm seeing combined with something that I'm like touching and, and then assuming that like, everything else I see like if I touch like it'll be solid and like if it feels I don't know like air like this or something then that's the space um but then it gets really trippy because um <laughs> I, I don't know how to explain it but um well, if I close my eyes, then like all I can touch is like right here. And like everything that's like space is just an idea, right? Like I'm imagining that when I open my eyes, things will be ordered and like look in a certain way, but that's a thought. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, I don't know, it was, that's what I was assuming. I'm, that you were talking about when you were talking about. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, the only, only thing on that, and I would just wanna say that when I brought up my finger from my hand, that example, I really wanted to uh, dissuade anyone from thinking of space as like air, like the, like, 
and, and definitely not outer space. So this is definitely not outer space. And it's also not exactly like the, the air space. It, again, it's more conceptual of like, for example, I don't think I'm you. And therefore there's, there is space between us. And I don't mean the vast distance of space or even the space between here and the, the computer. I just mean that, that I don't think you are me, there is separation. That I don't think my phone is me, there's separation, there's space between us. And I just wanna remind you that if there wasn't space, <laughs> it would be me. Exactly like when I said, oh, look, my hand, space. But when I say me, no space anymore. It's so subtle. <laughs> it, and again, it's an aspect of thinking, an aspect of discerning. And it's a very subtle aspect because again, if you recognize that, that it's like, oh, space isn't out there. It's like, it's something I'm using to think. That's where you could actually kind of start to just pay attention to space and begin to notice that it's kind of everywhere. And there's almost a kind of a, a blurring that you could blur and see everything as space. But again, not as like air space but as possibility or allowance in that way. Okay. Oh, I also had a question. Sure. Because um, I had heard like pretty much, yeah. So I heard you talking about the, um, the image you had mm -hmm. and, um, and how you could see the space as like the white part in the middle or the space mm -hmm. as the, um, black part like the faces and then you talked about what that had to do with like that one line mm -hmm. um and I was washing my hands and I missed it <laughs> <laughs> so could you just uh, say that again yeah yeah so I was just so and that was a long about space and the realm of space that was just a long introduction to when it says that our queen, Srimala, in that state of mindfulness, the Buddha appeared out of space. What I'm getting at is, is that it's in that dimension or from that dimension that we've just been talking about for, for a little bit now, it's from that dimension that the Buddha arises. And in terms of the narrative, you, yes, you could imagine Queen Srimala sitting, meditating, being mindful, and the Buddha sort of appearing before her. It's what it sounds like, and emanating light. But I would suggest that this is to be read at kind of two different levels. A narrative level where the Buddha's on a cloud, and here's Queen Srimala, and then at a, at a deeper level where they're actually talking about having an experience of the body of the Buddha out of the realm of space that I was just describing. And what, why this is going to be relevant to everything to come in this sutra is the sutra and many Buddhist sutras, they often talk about the Buddha and the Buddha's body being like space, like space. They use it as, as an analogy, as an example. And the thing about that is, is that if you're, not, if you're not hip to Indian philosophy and the way that they use this idea of space, then you might think the Buddha is an astronaut if he has a body like space. But if you understand, oh no, space is this wild dimension of reality that is in relationship to the realm of form, form, matter, stuff. Look, it's Michael, I'm here. 
In other words, the realm of form, this body, the physical body versus here, I'm not the Buddha. I'm a physical being. I'm Michael. I'm in a body. The, the, all of this stuff, my water bottle, all of these are objects that are in form, made out of matter in that sense. And so when they start talking about the incomparable body of the Buddha that arises out of space, it's going to, and this is what the sutra is about, by the way. So if anybody's like really starting to scratch their head, it's what the whole sutra is about, is coming to this understanding. So we are not even actually supposed to understand this yet, frankly. I'm doing the thing where I kind of teach it before I'm supposed to, but anyways, Tanya. So it sounds to me like, you know, from all the stuff that you were saying that the reason that Queen Vimala can see his, him emerge from space is because she's, she read the letter and it put her in that state of mind where she can see him, you know, like you were saying about like our condition, you know, like the conditioning and being able to see the the vase or the two faces has to do with you know what's we've experiences we've had so what you can see so yep. it seems to me like her reading the letter like she just was like you know she could does that kind of make sense absolutely i just want to add to that i just add to that i want to remind you that at the beginning it said yeah don't we all want to read the letter um i i want to um at the beginning, it said, oh, let me find the line. It said, if we wrote her a letter, where, where is, sorry, I just want to get the language right. Um, the king and the queen then wrote Srimala a letter praising the immeasurable merits of the Tathagata. So we don't have the letter per se, but we know what it was about. And it was a, a letter that was praising the merit, the punya of the Tathagata. And I mean, honestly, you know, um, there's a way in which I, I didn't, I didn't lean I didn't lean into it too much, but I could have, and I probably should have. But if you remember when I was walking us through moments ago, walking us through the three realms, the realm of desire, the realm of form and the formless realm. And if you, I slipped it in there and I said, you know, the realm of desire is this really, you know, it's about dukkha. It's about anxiety and stress and fear and all of this. And the realm of form is this much more kind of neutral, equanimous realm where, you know, just because something's shaped like this or like this, it doesn't make this any better than this. It's just, this is this and that's that. So there's a way in which the realm of form is, is upekshik, is what the Buddhists would call it, equanimous in that way. The realm of space is crazy equanimous. <laughs> like wildly equanimous. That's a, that's, that's a virtue or a quality of the Tathagata, equanimity, peacefulness, tranquility. I'm trying to praise and extol the virtues of the Tathagata here. So one could imagine that the king and the queen, their letter, I think we're to understand that it was a a really kind of a detailed Dharma talk letter where it kind of actually talked about the Buddha and about ending suffering. We're going to see the lion's roar has not happened yet. It is not this poem, by the way. This poem is her, her elation again. She's just like so overwhelmed by this vision. Then she's going to drop the lion's roar on us. And that's going to be much more about the or original teaching of Buddhism, which is about the alleviation of suffering. So it's not going to go very far. It doesn't go far from basic Buddhism. Um, but yeah, it's going to take us a second to get there. So again, the letter is, you know, I always say this in these sutras, the opener is always 
it the opening chapter is always the entire sutra in summary and it's always presented in this way where you're supposed to be like what does that mean the incomparable body of the buddha i want to know more well you 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 took the bait in a good way in an upayak way and now you'll read the sutra to find out what it means and it'll deliver that's sutras always deliver on their promises in that sense yeah tanya yeah that was my next question is like what does it mean by the incomparable body like what does that mean but it sounds like we're going to get there well i, I we are going to get there but i will always use the opportunity of a good question this my body very comparable very comparable to other uh people in that way in, in fact everything here is comparable to something else so what does it mean to say the incomparable or, or incomparable body of the buddha hmm <laughs> see that's always my dharma trick Think of the opposite, right? <laughs> exactly. Unconditioned, incomparable, inconceivable, immeasurable, illimitable. All of these adjectives, all of these superlatives are about the unconditioned. I didn't catch whose note that was, but you got it. Okay. Now we're on easy street because we, we, we did a good uh, talk there. So after that happens, after the Buddha appears out of nowhere, gives off this radiant light, and I didn't talk about the light, but we'll talk about the light in a bit, like in weeks to come, um, and reveals this incomparable body of the Buddha. Then the poem goes on to say, and again, I'm, I'm tempted to to continue reading this in the voice of Srimala. Most other uh, translators take this to be the voice of a narrator who says, At then Srimala and her attendants bowed their heads to the feet of the Buddha and with pure minds praised the merit of the truth of the Tathagata or of the Buddha. I would read it though, still in the voice of Srimala where she's speaking in the third person and saying, Srimala and her attendants bow their heads at your feet and with pure minds praise the merit of the truth of the Buddha. What's beautiful is the Chinese allows both readings. It's a, a beautiful, again, a beautifully broad language that you could read it that way or you could read it that way and they're both on the page. In English, you have to make choices, you have to make these decisions. And so I'm gonna, I go with that one. So after she sees the Buddha, apparently her uh, servants and attendants saw the Buddha as well. They bow down at his feet, they say. Again, is this, did the Buddha appear physically and they're bowing at his physical feet? We're, it kind of will remain to be seen in that way. And then it says, with pure minds, they praised the merit of the truth of the Buddha. And that's the, uh, I didn't mention it this time, I mentioned it last week. The title of this first chapter is the, uh, what is the title of the first chapter? The Merits of the Truth of the Tathagata. That's the title of the chapter. If you remember, that's basically what the king and the queen wrote in their letter, praising the merits of the Tathagata. It's what Sri Mala read, got so excited about, had a vision of the Buddha. And then with pure minds, they praised the merit of the truth of the, the Buddha. Then we're back to Sri Mala proper if we were ever apart from her in that way. And her poem continues. The subtle body of form of the Tathagata, the thus come one, is without equal in the world, incomparable. Ah, incomparable, inconceivable. For this reason, I now give praise. 
the form, the, the rupa, the form of the thus come one is inexhaustible. Wisdom, pranya, is also like this. All phenomena, all dharmas eternally abide. And for this reason, I rely upon you. Tamer of mental afflictions, as well as the four types of bodily afflictions, the one who has arrived at the stage difficult to master. It is for this reason I revere the king of the Dharma, the Dharma Raja. Knower of everything knowable, sovereign body of wisdom, harmonizer of all dharmas. For this reason, I now give praise. Praise the immeasurable. Praise the incomparable. Praise the limitless dharma. Praise the inconceivable. Again, show pity, bestow pity, have pity on us and protect me and cause these seeds of dharma to increase in this world and in lifetimes to come. I wish only for the Buddha to always accept me. Then we are to understand that this is the voice of the Buddha saying, I have supported you for a very long time in former lives teaching you. I now again accept you and in future lives as well. Cut back to Sri Mala. I have already produced great merit now and in the future, with roots of virtue like these, solely wishing to experience acceptance. Okay, um, I'm going to pause there. So yeah, I want to pause there just to highlight a few things. So again, this opening poem is, there's a lot going on in here, but there's also a way in which it's just an opener. And so I'm glad we had such a good talk about the realm of space and the realm of form. In particular, I'm kind of really happy with a bunch of the questions that came up because it allowed me to speak about this idea of what they might be talking about regarding this subtle body of wisdom, this subtle incomparable body of the Buddha. In other words, we're definitely clearly to understand this is not <laughs> this kind of body. It's a subtle, incomparable, it's a, it's a whole other kind of body in that way. And again, I'm glad that I could make the, you know, make that statement where I said, this body is comparable to some other body. It's that kind of body. So what does it mean to talk about the incomparable body of the Buddha? This idea of an inconceivable body, this idea of a, <laughs> this idea of, a, of an unequal throughout the world body. Again, the whole sutra is about this body, like big, big time, about the Dharmakaya, as it's called, the Dharma body. So this opening poem is just supposed to entice us. Before we end the night, I want to say one thing because I kind of want to finish the poem. There's a word that gets repeated several times, and it becomes the title of a chapter, it becomes the content of several chapters. And so I, I have yet to see any other translator point this out. 
I think it's really important. So there's a beautiful word. There's a beautiful word in Sanskrit. It's called samgraha. And this word samgraha, it's, it's, um, it means to bring together, I translated it here as to harmonize. And it's a, it's a really interesting word, samgraha, to bring together, to unify, but in particular, and I won't, yeah, I won't try to even do the, like draw it, but the Chinese character is a beautiful Chinese character that has the, it's called the radical, which means it's the root part of the, the character. And it's the picture of a hand. The other part of the character are three ears. And I really like to translate this Chinese, it, you have a few different options to go with, with this, this Chinese character, but one of the meanings, and it's the meaning that I really like, because it really goes with the actual pictogram, it goes with the actual character. I like to translate it as harmonize, because you have three ears and a hand, and the hand is actually holding a stick. So you really get a sense from the Chinese character of a conductor trying to get three voices together so that they sound together. So to translate that Chinese character as harmonize, I think is a really nice one. Again, it can mean unify, unite, bring together, join. You know, so there's a lot of different uh, ways to do it, but it's the way it's the way that the Chinese translated this samgraha, samgraha, to bring together, to harmonize. So just to conclude this part, Srimala here, after praising the incomparable, immeasurable body of the Buddha, after all of this, she says, in, in this world and in lives to come, my only desire, my only wish, is for the Buddha to always samgraha me. And so everybody, I think, I think Diana Paul does it as accept me, please accept me. I think most people translate this as accept me. It's, I, you know, again, it's, it's, like if you look it up in a dictionary, they're not wrong. They're not wrong to translate it that way. But as we move forward in this sutra, this sutra becomes all about what, what does that mean? What does it mean for the Buddha, this, and especially this weird out of nowhere, out of space Buddha, what does it mean for that Buddha to harmonize someone? And then, so she says, in this world and in lives to come, my only wish is for the Buddha to accept me, to bring me into the fold, so to speak, right? And then she ends her poem by saying, again, with roots of virtue like these, with the sole wish, with the sole desire of seeing myself harmonized. So I just want to end it on that, that that's sort of what, Sri Mala has said she's had this vision of the Buddha. She has then been kind of elated by this vision and then heaped a, a tremendous amount of praise upon this Dharma, upon this subtle body of the Buddha, and has asked for this samgraha. So that's where we're going to pick it up next week with what that means to be accepted by the Buddha. Thank you, everybody, for being here at the Dharma doors. I'm going to pass it over to Gnome for any SFDC news.